Hi, my name is Ezio Lazzari. I'm the manager of the Sandro. And today we have a very special guest, and is uh, Sandy Gross. Sandy Gross is one of the most prolific designer of speakers we, in, in our industry, and uh, is came to the Sandrum as uh, one of the oldest, possibly the oldest dealer he has, and he's going to tell us a little bit about how the speaker works and uh, what's so special about the speakers, and uh, uh, maybe a bit of a glimpse of what's coming next. So there is Sandy. Thank you. Thank you, Etsy. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm very glad to be here. I want to say, first of all, that this, this store is, I, I haven't been to this particular location before, is a fantastic specialty audio store. You know, we're all about specialty audio. My, my, I'm going to talk a little bit about my background, my history, what I'm into in terms of the, the product. I'm going to talk a little bit about the technology, the speakers. I ask, though, you know, if you have any questions, to please interrupt me and ask, because I'd like to give everybody as much information as possible. So I, I have been involved in audio all my adult life, and in fact, a little earlier than that. Um, I went to the Johns Hopkins University from 1968 to 1972, and I was the person in my dorm who came to school with a hi-fi. You know, 1968 was all about music, as we remember, or I remember. And I came with a really, really good hi-fi, and mine was the room that people came to and partied all night and, you know, did what we did in those days and listened to the music and, and enjoyed. And, while I was at Hopkins, I kind of progressed from the basic level of what I was doing in terms of audio. I started buying used equipment, used tube amps, big speakers, you know, from the Sunday classifieds. So at the point that I graduated, I had these huge speakers, big tannoy gold speakers the size of small refrigerators and acoustic labyrinths. I had Marantz 9 amplifiers and Marantz 7C preamp, and this is sort of where I was coming from. I was a tweaky audiophile. And when I graduated from Hopkins, two friends of mine and myself started a classic, I guess the classic American story, a, a company in a garage, a speaker company, and that company was called Polk Audio. And it was quite successful, and you know, I did the concept for most of the products. I'm a concept person. I'm not an engineer, but I definitely designed the product in, in a lot of ways. And my focus was always in bringing the sound quality of the most expensive products into products that made sense for real people. And I was able to, to do that. You know, I was into the tweaky high-end products, but I also had a good feel for value, quality and value, and the concept of, again, building products that make sense for real people. So this is kind of what I set out with my first company at Polk, and we did that. I left, I left Polk in 1988, and I decided to pursue my dream, or what I thought was my dream, which was to make film. And I went out to California, bought a house up Benedict Canyon, got involved in some film production projects. And the audio industry is crazy in and of itself, but the film industry is really nuts. And I stayed there for two years, and then I decided it was time to get back to my knitting. And I went back to Maryland, and I started my second company, which was Definitive Technology. And that was 1990, and we, we came out with some pretty great products, you know, over the years that I was there. Um, we, we, we really led the marketplace in terms of industrial design with, with some of the products. We introduced Don Javogue, my business partner there, and now again at uh, Golden Ear, we introduced the concept of building subwoofers into the speakers themselves. You know, there were a lot of things that I introduced over the years. Even back at Polk, you know, nowadays having really high quality speaker cable is kind of a, a standard thing, but back when I started in audio, we hooked the speakers up with lamp cord. And in the mid-70s, I was actually the person 
that introduced the first super speaker cable, the first high quality audio cable. So again, it's the sort of thing that I've been into. Anyway, we went through what we did, you know, at Definitive, and then I left in, uh, well, we sold the company in 2004, and I left in 2008. I thought when I, we sold the company, I thought I'd stick around for a year or so, but really, you know, speakers are what I do, and I love designing the products, I love creating, I love, you know, interfacing with, with our industry and you folks that love the products. And so I stayed on and I left. I thought I was going to retire in, um, oh, I guess that was 2009. But, you know, after a few months, I got bored. You know, much to the chagrin of my wife, I decided I was going to go back and make speakers again. So I convinced my uh, business partner to come out of retirement and we started to look at the project that fall and started to evolve the concepts and then we launched Golden Ear. And it's been quite a, an amazing launch. You know, I think Golden Ear has been the most successful new speaker company launch, I believe, ever. You know, at this point we have 150 dealers in the U.S. and Canada, and we're distributed in a dozen foreign countries, and this is only, oh, a year and a half out from when we started shipping the first product. But I think the success of what we've done relates to a lot of things, certainly our background and our track record, but I think the quality of the product is just exceptional, and the reviewers and the response of listeners like yourself, you know, who listened today for the first time, has been, you know, that the product is, is extraordinary. You know, again, my focus has always been quality and value. You know, you can go out there and try to design the world's best loudspeaker, and that's a difficult proposition, because it's very hard to say, you know, this is the best. Loudspeakers are, you know, by definition, not perfect devices, but to design the best product at a reasonable price, that's a whole different different challenge. And again, this is sort of what I've done. And the response to, you know, our Triton, well, our Triton 2 over here, you know, this is our signature product. And we launched this again about a year and a half ago. And the series of reviews that we've gotten on the speaker has been absolutely unbelievable. Virtually every major publication and online publication and reviewer has raved that this compares in sound quality with speakers selling for many times its price, and, and it does. Um, <clears throat> the first review that we got was from Sound and Vision, and Al Griffin uh, wrote that review, and Al wrote that the Triton II um, delivered sound quality that reminded him of $50,000 a pair speakers, and these are you know, basically $3,000 a pair. So that was a great compliment. But perhaps the best compliment of all was Al purchased a pair of Triton IIs for himself. That's sort of the ultimate compliment, really, from, from a reviewer. So what, what we've tried to do with the product, we come and I come from a, a music background. And we, we feel very strongly that the product should excel for both music and home theater. And if the speakers are designed properly, they will. You know, everything that makes the speakers good for music also makes them good for home theater. But home theater um, gives special challenges to the product in terms of dynamic range and imaging and bass response. So if the speaker sounds great for music and also has great dynamic range, in other words, it'll play loud, that it has excellent bass and the imaging, you know, or the ability for the speakers to disappear is great, then they excel at home theater too. Now, people ask me, you know, what, what is the most important thing to me in a speaker? You know, what, is, what are these systems about? And I, I talk about it in terms of the, the suspension of disbelief. You know, what we're trying to do with these systems is to make it, if you're sitting here or you're sitting at home, you want to you want to believe that John Coltrane is reincarnated in your living room, or that you're sitting at the Village Vanguard, or you're sitting at Carnegie Hall, or if you're watching home theater, that you're in the middle of the Amazon jungle or the middle of World War III, 
But it's hard to believe that, you know, when you're sitting in your living room or here, for instance, in the store. So we want to suspend that disbelief and have you believe it. The better the system is, the better and the closer we get to that. And when you get a really great system with just the speakers, you can close your eyes and it sounds like the musicians are here. You know, even earlier today, I think folks were remarking that it sounded like it was live music and that's what we're, that's really what we're trying to do. But, you know, what is the most important thing? You know, with audio, a lot of people get a little overly fanaticized in terms of specifications and measurements. Now, we focus very, very hard on making the product perform well in terms of standard measurements and such. We have a, a, a quite an elaborate uh, development facility. We have a full-sized anechoic chamber, which is a duplicate of the anechoic chamber at the NRC in Ottawa. Our, our facility is, you know, a duplicate of that chamber and we have eight full-time engineers working on the product and they do a lot of measuring of the product. But the measuring of the product really gets us into the ballpark, you know, and then really dialing it in is when you sit down and you listen, and you listen, and you listen, and you tweak, and you play with it to get it right. So one, one of the aspects of the suspension of disbelief that's always been of utmost importance to me from the very beginning is imaging. Now what do we mean by imaging? When we have, let's say we're listening to two speakers, we don't want to hear the left speaker and the right speaker. We want the speakers to totally disappear and to have a sound stage or a spread of sound across the room. And if it's really good, again, the speakers disappear. It extends beyond the speakers left and right. If it's really, really good, you get height. Now, God knows we don't know how that works. Well, we sort of have some idea, but you get height, you get depth, you get projection forward. but. Imaging is, is an interesting phenomenon because we can't measure it at all. Nobody has ever come up with any way of measuring imaging, but we can hear it. You know, imaging is actually a psychoacoustic phenomenon. You know, the speakers produce the sound, you have two ears, your ears take in the sound, and then your brain processes it. You know, and this all happens subconsciously, but it takes all the sound and it puts it together and then you hear what you hear. You know, when we have two speakers playing and you hear the vocalist with our speakers that does a good job right in the center, there's no sound right in the center. It's not floating here in the center. It's coming from the speakers to your ears and your brain is processing it psychoacoustically. This is how, how it works. So. We, as I say, we can't measure it, but we've learned a lot about what makes a speaker image well. Now, one of the things that makes a speaker image well is to make it narrow. You know, we've discovered this. Then why, you know, why is a narrow, why does a narrow speaker image better? This is, this is one of our drivers. This is a mid-range driver from the Triton II and you have a driver mounted on a baffle, you get the primary radiation of sound coming off the cone itself. But you also get sound that kind of moves sideways along the baffle and it's re-radiated at the edge of the baffle. If you want to minimize the distance or the time delay between the initial radiation and the re-radiation of sound at the edge of the baffle, and if you get it minimal enough, your brain doesn't hear it as two separate radiating sounds, but it just puts it together. But what happens is, is if the baffle is wider, you get this re-radiation and it interferes with your brain's processing psychoacoustically of the signal, and it interferes in making the speaker disappear, and it makes you hear it more as a box rather than the pure sound source. So this is imaging. Questions as we're going along, anybody? So, you know, this is one of the things, you know, people, people ask me with speakers, you know, we're very focused again on value, but people ask me, you know, how do we make a $3,000 pair of speakers sound like a $50,000 pair of speakers? 
And years ago, people said of you know, myself and my team, we hear very well and we care. You know, a lot of companies on their lesser expensive speakers don't lavish the kind of development time that they might on some very, very expensive speakers. Or some of the companies making less expensive speakers may not lavish the kind of time that a company making $50,000 a pair of speakers does. We do. You know, it's, it's expensive in its own way, but it really pays dividends. So we care, we hear very well, and we care. But with a speaker, there, with any audio component, I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people might think a $10,000 preamp is a cost no object preamp, or a $20,000 preamp is a cost no object preamp. But cost is almost always an object in the development of these products. You know, if you wanted to build a real cost no object preamp, it might be $150,000. And the same thing goes on with the speaker. Part of what we have to do as speaker designers trying to design value-oriented product is to make decisions on cost. You know, you're always making decisions on cost because you can almost always spend more money building the product and then the product becomes more and more expensive. So some of the things, like we're using in all of our speakers this high velocity folded ribbon. And this is quite unique. You know, in this store, in most stores, every speaker has a dome tweeter. This is a little half of a, hem it's a hemisphere, half of a sphere, and it moves forwards and backwards and it pushes and pulls at the air. And the dome tweeter can be pretty good or it can be better than pretty good, it can be really good. But it has certain limitations because the dome itself, above a certain frequency, starts to flex and you get a breakup, which adds distortion and such. When we started on this new project, I wanted to make sure that we made product which was absolutely, unquestionably, much better than anything we had done previously and much better than anything available anywhere near the price of what we were, what we were doing. So I, 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 I focused on this technology, this high velocity folded ribbon, and I feel, you know, is this the ultimate tweeter? No. The ultimate tweeter is an ionic tweeter. I have ionic tweeters at home. You know, we use them in our development work. An ionic tweeter ionizes air, so it has no diaphragm, and it just moves the air itself without having a substrate that's moving. But these have certain issues that give off ozone. They're very expensive. They're, it doesn't make sense for real product. I mean, I, at one point in time, back at Polk, we were thinking of coming out with a speaker with an ionic tweeter, which was sort of crazy, but we had Dr. Klein himself, who was the inventor of the most recent of these tweeters, in our office, and we had the checkbook open, and we were gonna sign a check and license these tweeters, and at the last moment, I said, stop, stop, this is really crazy. It doesn't make any sense. It didn't make any sense, but this tweeter makes a lot of sense. So what is unique about this tweeter is that rather than moving forwards and backwards, even a ribbon tweeter, that people call this a ribbon, would be a flat planar surface that moves forwards and backwards. This one is folded like an accordion. It's actually pleated and it moves this way and it squeezes air out like an accordion squeezes, and it's a much more efficient way of grabbing hold of the air in the room. So we call it the, the impedance matching to the air in the room is much better, but a better way to describe that is it grabs hold of the air better. It doesn't have a breakup mode, it goes out really far, but it has very low distortion, and it's very, very smooth. You know, a lot of people, when they listen to a hi-fi, they're looking for this artificial sound, what I call in the high end, the hi-fi zing, you know, that adds a zingy quality that you hear with everything. And that's not right. You want it extended, open, clean, but you don't want that artificial zing. That's a distortion. This tweeter doesn't have it. It's interesting, when we started our project, I went to my head of engineering and I told him I wanted to use this technology. And he said, he rolled his eyes and he said, 
oh my God, what we don't go through for marketing, I'll see what I can do with it. And at the end of the project, he said, this tweeter is incredible, I've never heard anything like it. So it's just part of what we're doing. But this tweeter costs us many, many times as much as a high quality dome tweeter. It's a place that we decided it was worth spending the extra money because the difference was dramatic and it made, it made sense. But other places, for instance, you know, the cabinet, it's very important to have a solid non-resonant cabinet. Our cabinet is well braced, it's designed using, using um, vibration sensors on the cabinet when we're developing it. But if we wanted to make a cost no object cabinet, and there are companies that are doing this, we would machine the cabinet out of a solid block of aluminum, which you might realize would be very, very expensive. It doesn't make any sense. So we've had to make decisions. But there are a lot of things with the speaker design, there are a lot of things that make the speakers sound better that don't cost more money to do. And so we focus, we've learned a lot of these things over 40 years of, of work on speakers. I use as an example, I'll just give you an example of this, the apical glue bond. Now how many people have heard of apical glue bonds? Just no, but just me. Anyway, what is an apical glue bond? Why is it important? Again, there are a thousand and one things in the speaker, maybe five thousand things. We try to focus on every little detail because we take it very seriously. You have a voice coil which has wire wound around it and it's in the magnetic gap. It's like a little electric motor. It moves forwards and backwards and it's coupled to the cone. And the cone is what actually radiates, in this case, radiates the sound. Well, the, the voice coil is glued to the cone at the apex, and that's the apical glue bond. Different glues transmit the energy in different ways and have different sonic characteristics. Some glues sound better than other glues. You know, they don't cost more to use the right glue, but you have to know this. You know, you have to have the knowledge and you have to care. So that's a good example of a little detail with, that we get into, you know, that really makes a difference in the sound. And when you do a thousand of those things, they all add up and they help to give us this kind of sound quality, you know, that we've achieved with, with our products. I mean, other things, the glue that, that joins the surround to the cone itself is important. The, the, you know, our spider leg baskets, the baskets are very, very open. This is something that's important. The curve of the cone is critical. You know, when we set out to do these, usually a mid-range driver like this will go out and have a breakup mode, again, where the cone starts to flex in different directions at the same time, up at around six kilohertz. We cross it over about 3,500, 3.5 kilohertz. Often people will think, well, the, the, the driver, the cone may misbehave up at six or eight kilohertz. It doesn't matter because it's crossed over below that. But it does matter because that's a resonance in the system. And any time you put any energy into the system, you, hit, you make that resonate. And it sucks energy away that you're trying to reproduce other frequencies with. This particular cone, just doesn't have that breakup and it goes out smoothly out to 20 kilohertz. At 20 kilohertz it's very narrow in terms of its radiation pattern but it doesn't have the breakup mode. So, you know, again, this is the kind of thing that we focus on. We focus on these speakers, again, as though we were designing super tweaky, tweaky high-end speakers except we also have the knowledge and experience to bring this kind of performance into reasonable price ranges. Questions as we go along? So, the, 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 Triton, the Triton 2 has a built-in powered subwoofer. And again, as I mentioned, this is something that Don and I pioneered back in the mid-90s. You know, why did we build the subwoofer into the speaker? When, when we came out with those products back then, virtually every speaker company on the planet tried to copy what we were doing. But they didn't understand what we were doing. They thought we were just 
having a satellite and a subwoofer all built in like this is, you know, this is one of our satellites, so they thought that we were just taking a satellite and putting it on top of a subwoofer in a cabinet, and that was the built-in powered subwoofer. But that wasn't it. They built copies they thought, they didn't succeed with them, and they stopped, but Don and I, when we went into this concept, it was really to integrate a, low, a powered low frequency section into the speakers. The, 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 the powered low frequency section goes down into the sub bass, but it goes up higher than that. It goes up higher than you would normally have a normal subwoofer, up to oh, about 150 cycles, because the reason why we did this initially wasn't to get the subwoofer box off the floor, although that was a side benefit. It was to integrate the bass section and the sub bass section really well with the rest of the speaker really from a music standpoint rather than just a pure home theater standpoint. We did it for music because music matters. And that's what we've followed with all of our designs with the built-in powered subwoofers. It integrates much better, it blends much better because when you have a separate subwoofer box, you know, we go through a lot of work integrating the subwoofer and the woofer section in the speaker, getting it finely tuned to perfectly blend. And when you have a separate box and you don't even know where in the room it's going to go, it's very hard to get it to blend perfectly with the speakers. You know, just in its simplest way, if you have one subwoofer, unless you have it right in the middle between the two speakers, it's going to be a different distance from each speaker. And the distance from the speaker is a critical part of getting it to blend properly. So, you know, how can you put a subwoofer over there and get it to blend the same way with this speaker and that speaker? You can't. Again, if you're just, just listening to home theater and sound effects, it's important, but it's not critical. But if you're also listening to music, it's very, very critical. So we built powered subwoofers in. You know, people ask me, as I said before, you know, are your speakers, do they look like this to make them attractive? Or do they look like this from a performance standpoint? And luckily, I'm able to say that they look like this for both reasons. Again, as I explained, the narrow, profile of the speakers is something that really works from a performance standpoint, but it also looks great. They integrate into the home really nicely. They don't have as much physical presence in the room. The speakers, as you can see, they get wider as they go back. And what is that about? Well, besides the fact that it looks nice, you have non-parallel cabinet walls, so you don't get as much standing wave inside the cabinet. This Triton 2 has two of those mid-range drivers with one of the high-velocity folded ribbons in the middle. Then there are two active woofer subwoofer drivers on the front and two passive radiators on the sides down at the bottom of the cabinet to couple that low frequency energy to the room. So it's the basic technology of what we're doing with the speaker and as I say, the response has been, has been phenomenal all over the world. You know, I mentioned Al Griffin. Uh, Robert Deutsch, who was a reviewer from Stereophile that reviewed the speaker, when he heard the speaker for the first time at, at the Consumer Electronics Show, he sat down next to me. Before he listened, he said, so Sandy, how much do these cost? I said, Robert, Bob, I'm not going to tell you. You're going to listen to the speakers, and after you've listened to them, I'm going to ask you how much you think they cost. He chuckled. He listened. He loved them. He turned to me and said, so how much do they cost? I said, no, no, remember, what do you think? And what he said was, he said, well, if it was anybody else, I would say $20,000, $25,000 a pair. But because it's you and I know you're very focused on quality and value, I'm guessing $15,000 a pair. And he was off by a few dollars, as we know. When he wrote his review, he said that they had sound quality like a $10,000 pair of speakers because he didn't want to go quite that far out in print. But he obviously, you know, loved them. And it's just semantic, whatever we're talking about in terms of price points. But, you know, the value is there. Our Triton 3, which is over here, um, is a smaller version of the Triton 2. Also excellent, really the same sound quality as the Triton 2, 
but in a smaller version for people with smaller rooms or smaller budgets. You know, again, our speakers are well priced. They're not cheap because you can't deliver this kind of quality cheap. You know, again, we have to make decisions about where to, to compromise and not compromise to come out with the product of the quality level that we feel we can be proud of. The speakers then can package into a home theater system. This is the SuperSat 3. And let me... Now this, this is a satellite basically using almost the same mid-range drivers as the Tritons with the same tweeter. And this was designed, the multi-purpose speaker, as the rear surround speaker for a system with the Tritons or basically five of these with one of our little subwoofers makes a really nice subset system for you know less physical presence in the room with very similar, similar level of sound quality. And then there's another version of this which is longer, the SuperSat 50, which would be the center channel for the system with, the tri with any of the Tritons. We also have small bookshelf speakers, the Aeons, which we came out with this year, which are also getting fantastic reviews. You know, we wanted to build bookshelf speakers, again, that would compare in sound quality with speakers selling for five and 10 times their price. And from the reviews that we're getting and people's response listening to them, I think we've well succeeded. I won't say that they're better than the $25,000 a pair little bookshelf speakers machined out of solid blocks of aluminum, but I think you could put them up against them and have a, uh, a debate about which ones sound better. And again, I'm not going to say ours sound better, but they're quite competitive, and when you listen to that kind of difference in, in cost, I think the concept of what we're doing is very clear. Questions? Um, the, the, the center channel, which we don't have here, again is a, a thin speaker that's designed, it can go up on the wall, it's thin so it complements the plasmas and the other thin panel TVs. It can also go vertically on the wall on either side of the TV. And that particular speaker, you know, people ask me, gee, why don't we have a big giant center channel to go with the Tritons? And it was my feeling at this point in time, in the past, we made big giant center channel speakers when we had big giant rear projection TVs that we could put it on top of, but now people have really thin TVs. And so I felt that a thin speaker, this kind of thickness, to go up with the TVs made a lot more sense. And when the way we set those up with the speakers, because people say, gee, how can they work properly with speakers this big, is we have base management systems in the electronics. And you set it up with a 100 cycle crossover on the center channel. It then takes the base information from the center channel and it feeds it into the powered subwoofers in each Triton. And they reproduce that base information. Almost by definition, the center channel is midway between the two Tritons. So you get a phantom or a virtual center channel subwoofer and it really works well and again then we end up with a speaker that makes sense for the way people want to use these products at this point in time. So I'm just thinking what haven't I covered? Ezio, questions? Uh, actually no, I don't really have any questions. You explained everything very very well. Um, plus I already asked you questions earlier so <laughs> Um, no, I think that that's... Um, so I've got one. Oh, okay. Sandy, so um, you've got the different models of, of speakers and different configurations. How can Soundroom best uh, uh, demonstrate these for the customer? Well, I think Soundroom does a great job of demonstrating them. You know, at this point in time, when we started in this industry, we and Ezio and Paul and you know we were audiophiles and we were really into sound quality and this is what we focused on and we made our our life's calling doing that we set up stores or companies to make high quality product we focused on 
demonstrating it and sharing these qualities with people. Now these, we call them big box stores, they've taken away a lot of the customers and people don't have an opportunity as much to be exposed to high sound quality. I'm diver diverging a little bit, but I'll get back to your point. But what we find is, you know, people, people love the a system that can do that. Uh, I, I, I describe this best. I have a, a place in New York and we, we have a lot of art collector, art dealer friends who come over and I had a couple come over who we've known for a long time. They have a geodesic dome out inside of Chicago. And these people would be the least likely people. They were not looking for new audio gear. But they came over and they listened to the system with the Tritons. They called up the next day and they said, Sandy, we want a pair. You could have knocked me over. So people, you know, really enjoy, you know, we don't make hard lung machines. We're not, we're not uh, you know, heart surgeons, but heart surgeons love what we do. You know, we give people enjoyment. You know, we make lives happy and these, these, this equipment can do that. And a, a store like the Sound Room is still dedicated to the high quality that we started with back when we started in this industry. So you have great products here that are well shown and well demonstrated. And I'm totally impressed. You know, I was thinking as I came in and as I was, you know, spending some time here earlier today, it's great to see that we still have specialty dealers like this that are focused on giving people the quality that they're looking for. You know, um, you, you, you never regret buying quality. You know, you, ju you regret when you compromise and get something that's not the quality of what you're looking for. So, you know, audio is still alive and well with specialty stores and people that appreciate it and it brings a lot of enjoyment into our lives and so I think they do a great job. I can't say enough about it. Yeah. So I have a question. Uh, what is the sonic differences between the Triton 3s and the Aeons? Well, the Triton 3, you know, again, has a built-in powered subwoofer section, so it clearly goes down deeper in the base. The Aeons have a similar imaging characteristic, and again, they, you know, I think they communicate the program material and the music or the home theater in a similar way. They disappear. You know, when you listen before, they, all of our speakers image great. They disappear and they sound very similar. When we were showing at the CES show recently, in uh, January actually, I was demonstrating in a room with our Aeons and with the Triton 3s and I was playing the, tri the Aeons and people would come in and listen and they go, oh, the Triton 3s sound great. And I laughed and I said, no, no, you're listening to the Aeons, they said, those little bookshelf speakers are sounding like that, I can't believe it. So they have that sound, but then when we switch to the Triton 3s, they're that much fuller sounding. So that's really, you know, what we're, what we're doing. But it's, it's a family sound. It's using the same tweeter, it's using the same, even though the driver is different, it's the same technology of driver, the same curve on the cone, the same multi-vein, this multi-vein phase plug that we, you know, engineered that's so, you know, quite unique. So it's using all the same technologies to give, and it's voiced by the same development group, which is a big thing. You know, a lot of people with, with speakers, they think, you know, if you have the same drivers, they're going to sound the same. You could make two speakers with the same driver sound absolutely, totally different. And the key, the magic is in the people when they voice the speakers to make them sound like we want them to sound and to make them sound with a family sound. I think when you listen to all of our speakers, they very much have a family sound. Another question about, about subs. And a lot of subs you see are about 150 or 200 amplifiers. Why do your well, we use so much power to have better control over the drivers. And, and I want to make the point also about the subs 
that our subs are not just about shaking the room, they're about high quality. I mean, when the program material says shake the room, they're quite capable of doing that. But a lot of subwoofers are designed more like, you know, these cars that drive around, when they drive by, they shake the whole street. You know, that's not what we're focused on. We're focused on realistic sound quality. So, you know, it's not just just a lot of power, although they have a lot of power, but we use the power in conjunction with the DSP that we build into them to really do a proper job of controlling the drivers. I know that you are going to come out with uh, ceiling and wall speakers. Are they going to use the same uh, technology in the tweeter? This yes, yes, they use a high velocity folded ribbon tweeter. Will they be exactly the same tweeter as you find in the regular lab? No, it's, it's similar, but it's, it's a little bit smaller so that we can get more dispersion and also fit it into the size of what we're, what we're doing. And we're going to have the first two in-ceiling or architectural speakers, they'll be in-ceiling or in-wall, and they'll have optional square grills if people want that. will be a five and a quarter inch one and a six and a half inch one. We'll then be releasing one that's angled, it's, it's flat to the ceiling, but it's angled at 30 degrees into the room. So it's designed to be a front main speaker in a high quality home theater system. That's the Invisa 7000, and that'll be coming out, and that's turned out to have a sound quality really very similar to the Aeon 3, which is not surprising because it's very similar drivers and again the similar voicing, the similar development group doing it. And can you tell me, you also have a, um, a sound bar which would be right, left and center and uh, you have some special ways of increasing the apparent separation. Well, right yeah, we, we felt, our feeling was, and it's something that I felt very strongly about, you know, we have sound bars are very appealing to people in terms of the form factor. You know, if you have a panel TV up on the wall, the concept of just having one speaker, one long bar underneath it is very appealing in terms of the way that it looks. Most of the industry have gone after sound bars not from a true high performance standpoint, but as a simple solution like a home theater in the box and they've used that form factor but they've compromised in terms of the quality of sound that these reproduce. Um, they're building the amplifiers in, they have simulated rear speakers. If you can imagine, you have the speaker in the front and you're simulating the sound as though it was coming out of speakers in the rear. And by playing around with phase, they can move in that direction, but they don't really achieve the kind of sound quality that we can achieve with a true component system. So I felt, and we're coming out with it, the the Super Cinema 3D Array, which is a sound bar that's a passive sound bar. It doesn't have amplifiers built in. It's designed to build a component system around. It has, you know, three basic speakers in it, but rather than just, just three speakers, it has interaural crosstalk cancellation. You know, there's a project going on at Princeton right now with uh, one of their actually rocket scientists focusing on imaging and he's discovered that this interaural crosstalk or your left ear hearing the right speaker and your right ear hearing the left really interferes with the, your psychoacoustic processing and your ability to perceive the image that's on the program material. So he's found that when you reduce that even a little bit it improves the imaging rather dramatically. And so with a separate set of drivers within the speaker, we cancel a lot of that interaural crosstalk cancellation. So we have a, a 49 inch wide sound bar that has a 15 foot wide image that actually starts to wrap around you. And this is designed to be used with a receiver and a subwoofer, powered subwoofer, and also rear speakers. You could use it without the rear speakers, but you can set up a full blown system with a sound bar in the front and get the benefit of that elegant form factor. Now we showed this product at the Consumer Electronics Show and people couldn't believe it. And I'll give you a couple examples of that. 
Um, the the t two of the reviewers from Absolute Sound magazine, very, very high-end audiophile magazine, gave it best sound for the least money at the CES show for speakers. And they were listening with two-channel music. Now, usually, most people don't want to demonstrate their sound bars with two-channel music. And they gave it, you know, audiophile raves based on that. Most of the reviewers who came by at the show said it was the best they ever heard in that type of format. But the best was my friend Neil Sinclair. Neil Sinclair, you know Neil Sinclair. Yeah, well Neil and I, have, we've been friends since the 70s. And Neil is retired from the audio industry. He had a company called Theta Digital, very high-end guy, had a high-end store at one point. And Neil was interested in a pair of our uh, SuperSat 50s to put out on his lanai in his home in Hawaii. And he wanted to hear them, and I, you know, I, I was busy. You know, he came in and he heard in my room, which, where I was demonstrating the Triton 3s and the Aeons. He said, as he, he said, these sound incredible. And then he kind of disappeared. We had in the room next door, we were demonstrating the 3D array. And he came back in and he said, yeah, Sandy, I listened to the SuperSat 50s and they sound great, I'd like a pair. And I said, where did you listen to the SuperSat 50s? He said, I listened to them next door. Now I had, it was a little bit of showmanship, I had a pair of SuperSat 50s on stands and I put them out sort of like this on either side of the system where we were demonstrating the sound bar because I knew people would come in, they would think they're listening to the SuperSat 50s and that would really go a long way to making our point, as it did with Neil. So he said, yeah, I heard him next door. I said, no, you didn't hear him next door. And he said, yes, I did. And I said, no, no, they're not even hooked up. You were listening to the sound bar, the 3D array. And he said, no way, there is absolutely no, he's getting angry, no way that I was listening to that sound bar. I was, no way he could do that. I was listening to the SuperSat 50s. I said, Neil, come next door. Went next door, picked up one of the SuperSat 50s on the stand. I said, you'll notice, Neil, these aren't wired up. He said, oh. <laughs> so I think that, you know, addresses kind of the response to that product, and that product will be coming this, this fall. So we're very excited. Again, you know, we kind of do things a little bit differently at Golden Ear, because we have our vision and our concept of what we think people want, even though they don't ask for it. You know, a lot of companies, they go and they make what people ask for, and you have to listen to what people want, but if you're really great, hopefully, at designing these products, you have to kind of leapfrog over what they're asking for and understand what people will want when you show it to them. Yeah? Uh, I've got a question about bipolar speakers. Yes. Uh, you know, definitive technology sort of brought that to the forefront. I, mean, I, I was a consumer of that. And I'm just wondering, in the scheme of things, where bipolar versus not uh, fits in these things. Well, when when I started Definitive in 1990, you know, we made bipolar speakers, and we were using bipolar technology to get the sound out of the box to help make the box disappear. As things went on, that was 1990. We learned a lot more about the speaker design, and we found you know, at this point in time, that we can actually get better imaging with a direct radiating speaker. You know, a bipolar speaker is interesting sounding speaker, but you lose a lot of clarity and focus. And they're also rather difficult to place in a room because you've got sound coming out the back, so you have to worry more about what's behind the speaker and how far from the wall it is and these kinds of things. And we found with a properly designed direct radiating speaker, that we can get speaker to totally disappear, we can get a bigger image, we can get much more focus and clarity and much easier to put into the room. And I think, you know, the performance of the Tritons demonstrates that quite, quite well. I have one more question. Yes. If a folded tweeter, a folded ribbon tweeter is a good idea because he squeezes the air out rather than pushing it. What about the water? Would the water work the same way? Well, you could, you know, you could increase the size of this. Now, 
you know, you could bring it down, you could make, I've thought about the concept of making a giant line source folded ribbon. There's certain issues with it, um, cost being a major one. You know, this tweeter uses, as I said, it's very, very expensive, and part of the reason is it uses a lot of neodymium, and neodymium is a very expensive magnetic material. If you were going to do a big one, you, probably, you might have $10,000 worth of neodymium in it, or, or maybe more. And I don't think that you could bring it, you probably could make one and bring it down to, and we've thought about it, down to maybe 100 cycles, which would really be pretty good, and then cross it over to a powered woofer section. And that would be very, very interesting, but I don't know how much sense it makes because it's going to be very expensive. Maybe it's somebody else's project. <laughs> or another time. Or another time. Well, anyway, I'd like to thank everybody for, for coming and, you know, listening to me wander on about what we're doing and hope everybody's enjoying the speakers. And thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.